please give a hand for Mr. Uh, Professor Dr. Ingenieur Michael Stanner. Thank you, Will. Uh, Edwin. <coughs> Good morning, uh, Dames and Herren. Um, I, I don't speak that much uh, Dutch as you speak German, probably. Uh, yesterday, when uh, yesterday your king and your queen were in Germany and they were speaking fluent German, I really admire that, definitely. So, welcome to my speech. Uh, thank you for coming here. Um, I will talk about energy storage. Uh, but first of all, we had now two presentations and I love the exercise it did before. So I'd like you to stand up again and answer one question which I have for you. It's good to do some animation in between. Um, so the next big thing, so that's my question. So what, when do you think uh, we will have in the Netherlands energy storage in our home systems, so on the rooftop systems? Uh, let's say 50% of the uh, households with PV will have battery storage in their homes. When will that be? Will that be in 2015? Uh, Please then sit down. Okay, you see it's not yet there. 2020? Okay. 2025? Okay. And some say 2030? Okay. <laughs> And, and later. Okay, so you saw already this is something coming up which is not yet there. We can install a lot of PV without doing storage. That's the main message which we also did and was just heading a study uh, for the Agora in Agiwende as well on energy storage. But there will be some momentum coming even if there is no demand from the technical side that people will just install. Uh, storage system at home because it increases their self-consumption and it increases their share of the used solar energy. So, and you're right, around 2020, 25, that's also my guess where we will see storage coming in. Why not today? Well, because about costs. It's about cost. So, um, let me give you, uh, yeah, I just said yesterday when I was sitting in Oldenburg, uh, the row before me, I took this picture, and it was a very funny picture. <laughs> they were, it was a very funny event. Uh, they were laughing, and it was, of course, very polite and so on, and it's nice, but, but we were really thinking of how can we link the markets, how can we, what can we do together with energy storage. Um, I, I'm one of the inventors of this power to gas. You have a lot of gas in the Netherlands, so it's uh, gas consumption, or um, Yes, upwelling goes down in the Netherlands, so why not think of also converting wind and solar into gas? And they were visiting that plant which we designed. Uh, they were at uh, Oldenburg at the university. There, is, uh, uh, there was uh, Mr. Luther, he initiated solar energy 30 years ago. We have a course for renewable energy, a master in renewable energy at Oldenburg uh, since 25 years. So really a long term, really they visited the pioneers and I would love my president to go for such conferences, you know. So I really admire you for having such uh, guiding people in front of there who, who are interested in renewable energy and who are interested in storage. Good, so um, you had various topics uh, on, the, um, on the agenda, so just to go a bit into the question on the storage demand in energy transition, I will sh show you the case of Germany. You saw already that we have this tremendous development of PV. You saw also the learning curve where we had such a, a line where it didn't follow. This was the German feed-in tariff because we were paying a lot uh, and it didn't follow again the cost reduction. And, and this is now really, really damaging the German uh, solar industry because we had this uh, six, seven gigawatts every year and we didn't cope it. We had industries growing which was not sustainable, now it's crashing down. So, and, uh, and we are now at the branch of 25% of renewables and we have the conventional power generations, generators coming in, a really strong lobbying against wind, against solar and that's why we have now this slowdown of the growth. So that's a really important issue on the storage demand. Then uh, I will talk a bit about the trends in st storage technologies, the forecast on the cost reduction, which is important. When do we see this technology? And the battery markets outside the park power markets. So the power markets won't demand very fast storage, but there will be some markets outside of these commercial markets. Um, commercial power markets. And, uh, 
So, and then finally go to the flex feasibility of renewables and storage scenarios. How could we really roll out these technologies? So uh, we didn't talk too much about that. Just to show you a graph, this is since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the uh, mountain of CO2 emissions we have built up. We uh, definitely have to step down from that. And it's good if we have cheap solar and cheap wind, because then we really can do this. And the energy transition, it's always a fourth and back in the discussion. Uh, in Germany, we definitely can say it's not, because people always say you're crazy. You do this energy transition, the Energiewende. Um, but for us, it's clear, not even talking about climate change. It's also a matter of resources. And it's not a question on if, but rather when. And so we have to think of, uh, rethink the systems. What we use today, 80% <clears throat> globally, is fossil energy, which is stored solar energy. Solar energy produced biomass. Biomass was transformed into oil, gas, and coal. And this stored solar energy is used. And what's the problem here is that we really inject that into the atmosphere in a very short time of period, and uh, period of time. So. <clears throat> Clearly, we will shift back to the 100% renewable energy supply, which we had for hundreds of centuries. And uh, now we shift it, and we have our power systems in charge, and they were always working with this, this stored fossil solar energy, so to say. Uh, and we have to think of the system again um, uh, from the side from where, where, what is the kind of the resources we have. So we need forecasts for wind and weather. We need to change our power markets. You cannot do trading one week ahead or one month ahead because you do not know how much sun and wind will there be. So we really have to adopt the, 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 the rhythm of the market uh, to the rhythm of wind and solar and to, uh, the metrology. And here we have the wind speeds in Germany. Of course, to the left, we have, yeah, we have the wind speeds, we have the radiance, we have the grid nodes, and that's what you see. We will have steep gradients of uh, solar, which is yellow. This is our line from the power consumption. That's the wind coming in. And, and you see, really, that's steep, going up and down. And that really hurts <laughs> the conventional power producers. Not only that they don't earn any more money, but they have really ramped their, or they, they crush their plants, because it's like they were used to go um, on full speed. So like to con drive constantly your car on the same speed. But now they need to brake and f speed up, brake and speed up again. And that really limits the lifetime of your utilities and of your uh, units. Um, so we have to clearly have an investigation on that. We work together also with the University of Groningen uh, on the uh, on this issue on weather dependencies. Of course, here towards the Netherlands from Northern Westphalia and uh, Lower Saxony, we have a long common border. Uh, we have the same weather conditions. If there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of wind everywhere. And what we are missing in Germany are the transmission lines towards the south, because people, uh, we have a very conservative government in Bavaria who does not want anything. No wind, no solar, no electricity lines, just nuclear. But we have a nuclear phase out. So what happens, as we cannot transport them down, we export them towards Poland. They are not fond of that because their coal power plants will make less money. And we, will ex we are exporting them to the Netherlands, uh, destroying your business case. So we really have an inner German problem. And I think, I hope that the EU will come up and say, OK, if you cannot solve this problem inside of Germany, we will have split a market zone. Northern Germany, southern Germany. And then the north of Germany will be very happy because they have cheap wind. And the south of Germany has to think of solar again. <laughs> OK? So but that's, that's, of course, also driving it. And, and uh, uh, the, the storage demand arises if you have inflexible power generations in so-called must-run units. If you have uh, CHP units, then you have surpluses. But what's clear, wind and solar will not make the transition on their own. It's not enough just to install PV and wind. We need flexibility. So we, need, we will have times where there is no wind and there is no solar. We need some flexible power generation that is not coal, that is not nuclear, uh, that will be gas. And we need power networks, as I said. We need demand side management. Uh, and we need, of course, storage. But in that order, so to say, because 
power network expansion and demand side management are the cheapest option and flexibilization of power generation and storage are the more expensive option. And then the storage issue, we have several, uh, we, we, we talk on short-term storage up to one day. These are batteries, these are pumped hydro, compressed air maybe. And we have a long-term storage, which is a hydro or the gas network. And that was the idea behind power to gas. We use wind and solar, convert it into gas. I will show you later how to do that. And then we can use the gas infrastructure with its storage facilities and the power uh, plants to then regenerate um, power with solar gas, with wind gas. That's how I named it. It's not natural gas. It's real natural gas. Huh? Good. Um, the surpluses which we expect if we really have the network expansion there in Germany. Uh, the surpluses here is the years. 40%, uh, we are now at 25%, uh, 60 80%, 100%, and this is the electricity surplus. Here we have the line of 10% of the gross production of, of electricity in 2012. So you see the storage issue will come up definitely after, it depends, after 80% of uh, share of renewables. Before, there is kind of a dead valley, because if you add so, uh, storage to the system, and just link it to the power market. It will buy cheap electricity and um, um, sell at the time where there's high prices. So it will buy usually coal and it will um, <coughs> push away gas. So in, uh, under the uh, yeah. cumulated, you would, have, you would have an addition of CO2 emissions in the German energy systems if you add storage. And that's kind of weird, but it's just saying that we have a too low price for CO2 because we have still our lignite coal power plants in the system. Good, but nevertheless, even if the story begins maybe in 20 years, really it begins, uh, we have to think of it earlier. And there are some trends which will come even if there is no demand. Um, when we talk about storage, we have to... Um, look on different aspects. First of all, we charge, and then we store, then we discharge. And in a battery, this is all in one unit. But if you think of uh, power to gas, we convert power into gas, we store it in the gas network, and we discharge via gas power plants. So uh, it's always a combination, or if you store heat, or if you generate fuels. And um, to check what facilities we have, we have the storage capacities on the logarithmic scale, we have the uh, discharging time, and you see we have capacitors and, well, superconducting magnets, forget about it because you have to have superconducting, uh, that, a lot of cooling efforts. The capacitors are interesting to, to balance out flickers and short-term fluctuations because they are good in a lot of cycling and then also economic there. The flywheel energy storage is interesting, and this, this is the unit which has always been told in the simulations or the scenarios. We were always told, always told you cannot go up to 30% renewables, wind and solar, but then you have to stop, because otherwise you will have a blackout. And this story comes because of the flywheel energy storage, which is, which is part of the conventional power generations, because the moving rotating masses keep the frequency in uh, the position, but the good news is you can replace them if you combine PV and wind with batteries. And batteries even can react faster than these flywheels. So this 30% limit or whatever is technically no longer an issue. So technically the storage problem is solved. So for short term we have batteries. Well, lead S is still the cheapest, but the largest potential of course lithium ion. Sodium sulfur is interesting on a, on, a, on a stationary. And redox flow, we have various technologies, but they are still very expensive. What's very interesting is that everyone has a heat storage at his home, and you could really also convert power into heat. Uh, that should be also not an obstacle, because it's very economic and can help you in uh, reducing your gas consumption. Uh, we have pumped hydro storage, which is an established technology. Uh, we have district heating system, uh, but on the very long scale, so really like if you have uh, energy consumption of a city like Berlin, you have only the, uh, the gas storage facilities. So caverns and aquifers, 
with caverns and aquifers, which we have in the north of Germany, we can really, uh, in combination with gas power plants, we can supply the uh, power of Germany for three months. So 70, 80 gigawatts for three months, no problem with this gas storage. You would need to set <laughs> a complete, uh, uh, cover the complete Germany if you want to do this with batteries. So there are different roles for short-term storage batteries and pumped hydro for long-term, it's power to gas. And I want to show you such a uh, plant. It took us a long time to, with the regulators, but now they're coming up and saying, well, batteries are not bad for primary control. And this was the thing where, as just said, we were limited. And now we can really replace conventional power plants. And there are first projects coming up. They do not, this is one which is not in containers. It's a five megawatt, five megawatt hour plant. Uh, so and it will stabilize the grid in northern Germany. Um, and it's, it's done by the company Unicos. They did also some off-grid uh, um, battery supplies in Graziosa in Portugal, but this one will be done in Germany. And they have um, now linked them up with an uh, with uh, American company, so they are on both markets. It's an interesting company. What's very important, we have a lot of people setting up uh, PV systems and battery systems at their homes. But what's an issue for the network uh, uh, drivers, if you have this curve of PV generation and you charge your battery in the morning and then at noontime you fully inject it to the grid. That gives steeper gradients, that gives a lot of flicker, that gives a lot of trouble to the network operators. So we really should avoid this uh, maximum self-consumption um, because you have more troubles and costs on the grid operation. So it's better, that's where we had to, we had to, to really encourage network operators to install the IT systems and have the limitation um, during uh, lunch time or during high feed-in times because then you really can uh, go down with the capacity of the net in use. You know, the grid and the network just counts in kilowatts, not in energy. It counts in power. And often if we have this case, uh, it is a limitation to further PV plants. You cannot install anymore because the capacity is booked, even if it's just used for a few, five hours a year. Huh? So it's intelligent to also think of a curtailing or, or using storage for go down up to 70% of the capacity, you lose three or four percent of energy, but you gain a lot of space in the network once if you are at that point. If you are install PV in the uh, urban areas, you do not have any network problems. Good. We have also the trend of storing power as heat. Here we have a, a 17 million project, 17 meter high uh, heat storage tank, which is connect, uh, connected to a district heating system. They have installed water boilers. That's the name for that, um, but it's very low cost and it's also efficient, but there is no way back. So you just produce heat, but you cannot go back from heat to power economically. Uh, pumped hydro, I said already, it's an efficient, well-established technology, um, but limited geographically. You cannot place anywhere. In the Netherlands, we will have some trouble in placing them. There might be some unconventional uh, pumped hydro if you use the rivers. But uh, yeah, here we have 1,000 meters height of difference, so it's really uh, well to do, but we have troubles with the acceptance. After Fukushima, and you know that Germans are quite anxious people, uh, they fear that this dam will break and their f city will be flooded, uh, even if, if the risk is almost zero. But okay, so also think of the social side, not only on the technical, economical side, you have also to convince people. So, power to gas. How does nature store energy on long-term base? Well, it's good to look at nature. And uh, nature does basically the same. We have solar energy. Solar energy is used to split water into water, hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is released. That's what we breathe in. What we breathe out is CO2. And that's used by the plant. And uh, nature does not stop at H2, at hydrogen. It goes, it combines it with CO2 because then you have longer hydrocarbons, you have higher energy density, and it does it with a very lousy efficiency of 1%. Yeah? So you have one square meter, you have an efficiency of 1%. If we look at the figures you had just there, uh, 
was, okay, record 44%, average maybe 20%, and people always say, well, it's so inefficient to do this technically. You lose 50% of the energy if you convert power to gas. And I say, yes, that's true, but have a look at the real efficiency if you compare it to nature. <laughs> we use solar energy at the same, uh, we have an efficiency of 20%, we lose 50%, uh, but then we have gas, we have wind gas, and if you want to generate biogas, you end up in an efficiency of 0.5%. So that's 20-fold more. Huh? So always if people say, well, don't put it here on the area because uh, we need still the food and it's so inefficient, you can tell them, well, <laughs> it's much more efficient in terms of energy gain. So the two core processes are splitting of water, hydrogen reacts with CO2, and we do this technically. Um, the guy who invented the reaction uh, was a French uh, chemist, uh, and he, he did that 100 years ago, but uh, me and my colleague, we, we said we could use this for energy purposes, and we generate hydrogen, we should use this as long as we can in chemical industry and so on, but we have the chicken-egg problem. There are no fueling stations, no affordable cars, fuel cell cars, and we do research since 20 years, uh, 30 years, but no outcome yet. And that's why we said, okay, let's solve this and add the CO2 in the methanation and then we have, this is a reactor where you just put in two gases and they react together at 200 degrees Celsius and six bars if you do it chemically, but you can also have kind of a bioreactor where you have small bacteria who do this job for you. And so then you have the gas facility which is underground, well accepted and large facilities there and then you can make power again, you can drive your car, etc. what Audi does and what the king and the queen, her majesties visited yesterday. So that's quite an interesting thing. You can also transport energy, you cannot transport a pumped hydro power plant from the south of Germany to Netherlands. So, but with gas you can do that. Um, the efficiency, I told you already, 50%, it's not that well, but if you use the heat and uh, CHP, etc., you gain it uh, better. And, of course, the economics are also not that uh, nice because it's, of course, way cheaper to dig a hole in Russia somewhere and just extract the finished product um, instead of uh, building up all these plants. Yeah? But nevertheless, it's just a matter of time and also kind of political reasons to produce your own gas. And you can produce your own gas in the Netherlands with this process. Um, E.ON did it, Audi did it. So we have several companies coming up with this. And now just a brief future trends and forecast on cost reduction. We did this study for Agora. Um, here we have a capacity of one kilowatt and four kilowatt our system. Pumped hydro still is the most favorable technology. Batteries cannot keep up with this still in 10 years ahead. But they will come in and uh, of course you cannot build a pumped hydro at your home. Uh, so on the modular basis batteries really have an advantage and what we see is that redox flow is still the most expensive but lead acid and, nat uh, and lithium will come in and then really become competitive to pumped hydro. Um, power to gas is running through a learning curve. We have now very few install capacities. It's all manufactured. There's one company in Belgium, Hydrogenics, who are producing this. It's 1,000 to 4,000 euros per kilowatt unit. But on the lower and upper bandwidth, if, you, if we assume a learning rate of 13%, we will have competitive costs at um, in the year 2023 and 2033, so 10 years ahead we think we will be in the market. So now a few words on the batteries markets outside the power market because that's very interesting for the PV business. Um, electric cars, you can tell me what you want, but we have now really, we are a car and manufacturing nations, but we have Tesla setting up the stations and they will blow some companies away, I think, because the German engineers love the engine and we really have a trouble in leaving away the engine, but that could be also the beginning of the end of this industry. Uh, but anyway, we have, uh, it's today, it's too small, it's a small market, but with a huge potential. Uh, per 1 million vehicles you have an addition of 3 gigawatts. So that also needs to be taken care of the grid. And the obstacles are of course the price, the image, the range, uh, the car sellers 
don't love to sell you an electric car because they don't know it. Charging infrastructure is mission. And also uh, for the active grid role, we need some IT facilities. Um, and to charge the car when the grid says yes and not the consumer says yes. The W's is interesting. If you link this to the grid, you could also provide control power, reactive power, demand set management. And the competitors, of course, are conventional fuels. That's why we do not see a lot of electric cars. But we have to look at this market. Because if you see, look at this trend in Germany, we think um, we can have in 2050 a range of 20 to almost 100% of the personal cars which will be electrified. And that gives us a range of gigawatts between, let's say, 20 and 100 gigawatts of uh, charging capacities. So that's really relevant for the system. What does that mean for the solar home system? That prices come down. And even if you have cars which are used for five years and you take over the battery, that means second life of this battery, then the battery is much cheaper. And you share the high costs, the car user and uh, the home user, or even the combination out of it if you're the car owner. The same happens with home storage. We have 7,000 systems in place today, 30 megawatt hours installed. But we will expect a strong boom. Now we have the feed-in tariff in Germany, uh, which had a large boom in the 2000s. So in, 2000, in 20 years' time, or in 15 years' time, we will have a strong boom. Uh, PV systems dropping out of the feed-in system tariff, and then they will probably buy a storage system. And um, the obstacles are that the capacity component in power price will, might come from the regulatory side. We need IT cons uh, connections again. Uh, the competitors are, of course, power to heat. You could just um, convert power into heat at home and not into electricity. And this is the capacity of the uh, uh, PV plants dropping out of the feed-in system. And you see here, at the end of 2020, we will have some gigawatts falling out. Yeah? Finished, they are paid, but still they are producing because we know PV plants, uh, PV panels live for 30 to 35 years. Uh, and so there's definitely a market, and you can bench that. And then you see, okay, in the midst of 2020, we definitely have some gigawatts of battery storage in the German market, even if the power system doesn't demand it. So finally, I'd like to conclude with a short outlook. Does this really pay off? Storage is expensive. We do not need it. Well, definitely it pays off. Uh, we always have these uh, discussions on the international level. We really have troubles. Uh, if you calculate the complete cost of nuclear and fossil, it's the most expensive. And we have a solution, which is called solar energy. Uh, but the guy is saying, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. I wait until it's cheaper. Huh? And, and that's just stupid. Uh, <laughs> and, and the good thing, again, with Agora and Agiben, they're doing a great job. Uh, it's, it's a foundation out of the uh, Ruhr area uh, from, uh, from the guy who is uh, owning Metro. Um, so uh, wind is below, and PV on the large scale are below the new generation cost of gas, coal, and nuclear. And that's a good thing. We are through. The rest is just running. And uh, OK, but wind, it was globally done. And uh, China and, uh, and so on, and US came up. PV, OK, we did it mostly in Germany. <laughs> but uh, now we are through, thank God. And uh, these are the costs for new power plants. And what I found most stunning, nuclear. Uh, in UK, you might have heard it, they request a feed-in tariff for nuclear. 11.5 cents, euro cents per kilowatt hour for 35 years, inflation cleared. So that's really bankrupt nuclear. We are through. What's now included in the cost is the storage cost on this side, but here again, the external cost of disposal of CO2 and nuclear waste. And if we open up the complete uh, uh, picture, we, act, we import in Germany every year uh, coal, oil, and gas for 100 billion euro. If we would invest this in 10 years, so in 10 years we burn 1,000 billion euros in Germany. This money goes abroad, it's gone. So we could use this to invest it in renewables, wind, solar, and the infrastructure which we need, networks and storage. And this is an attractive investment. 
If you look, uh, that's a bit broken, but that's the um, amount of money you save up to 2050 uh, by saved fossil fuel costs. And then you have to refinance your solar. This, is, this, uh, this was the solar boom in Germany. This is solar for the future perspective. Then we have wind, then we have electromobility, we have power to gas, we have infrastructure, we have uh, heating insulation. We have a breakthrough in the year 2030, and overall we have a return of invest of 4 to 7 percent. So really have a look at the complete system. It's not expensive. Uh, we had campaigns in Germany saying this is so expensive, but it's definitely not. Good. So on the conclusion, I think the energy vendor is not a matter of time. It's, it's just a matter of time. It's not a question whether it will come. And the storage problem is solved technically. We do not have any more issues. And people, if they tell you, well, you cannot install any more solar because we have first to investigate storage, that's nonsense. Uh, all storage technologies are required. There's no civil bullet. Uh, power to gas, you need also for mobility. We have also inventions on going into the seas using energy ships to generate uh, uh, fuels with uh, sailing ships. Um, but this is more of a future approach. Storage markets will evolve outside the wholesale power markets for control power, what Nikos does for mobility for home storage. And we need definitely a new market design all over Europe. Uh, there are now, as the, as the Fuller Towers go down from the conventional power producers, they go to Brussels and to Berlin and knock and say we need a capacity market in order to survive. And that's the only goal. But we definitely need also criteria in this for flexibility. You know, fast gradients ramping up and down, and that's really a big chance for storage. Uh, without the real framework condition, there is no large-scale development uh, possible. But first of all, we need to reduce the barriers. And of course, definitely, I think we need a price tag for CO2. And if we would have a, a, a running a, a emission trading system installed, which has really a, the real price for CO2, today we dispose it for four euros per ton. For your average home waste, you pay 1,000 euros per ton. So um, that, that could, we could create a fund to finance storage and clean power. And I think uh, we should really work for that in Brussels and other places. And that could push a lot, not even storage, but also wind and solar. So that's it. Thank you for your patience. There is a book I wrote on that, 600 pages. You can read through it. <laughs> it's a second animation. Thank you.